story one of jim the story of a backwoods police dog and other stories by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain story one part four the trail of the bear one the deputy sheriff of nipsiwaska county had spent half an hour at the telephone in the backwoods the telephone wires go everywhere in that half hour every settlement every river crossing every lumber camp and most of the wide scattered pioneer cabins had been warned of the flight of the thief dan black nicknamed black dan and how in the effort to secure his escape he had shot and wounded the deputy sheriff's big black dog whose cleverness on the trail he had such cause to dread as tug blackstock the deputy sheriff came out of the booth he asked after jim oh black dan's bullet broke no bones that time replied the village doctor who had tended the dog's wound as carefully as if his patient had been the deputy himself it's a biggish hole but jim will be all right in a few days never fear blackstock looked relieved you don't seem to be worrying much about black dan's getting away tug grumbled long jackson who was not unnaturally sore over the loss of his money now i ain't worrying much agreed the deputy with a confident grin now i know jim ain't going to lose a leg as for black dan's getting away well i got me own notions about that i phoned all over the three counties and give him warning to every place he can stop for a bite or a bed he can't cross the river to get over the border for i've sent word to have every bridge and ferry watched black dan's cunning enough to know i do just that first thing so he won't waste his time trying the river he'll strike right back into the big timber counting on the start he's got ahead of us now he's put jim out of the game but i guess i can trail him myself now i know what i'm trailing pretty nigh as well as jim could i've took note of his tracks and there ain't another pair of boots in brine's rip mills like them he's wearin and when are you going to start demanded long jackson still inclined to be resentful right now replied blackstock cheerfully soon as you can get guns and stuff some crackers and cheese into your pockets i want you to come along macdonald and you long and saunders and big andy as my posse meet me in fifteen minutes at the store and i'll have zeb smith's wear e in for the job if black dan wants to do any shootin it's just as well to have everything regular there were not a few others among the mill hands and the villagers who had lost by black dan's cunning pilferings and who would gladly have joined in the hunt in the backwoods not even a murderer unless his victim has been a woman or a child is hunted down with so much zest as a thief but the deputy did not like too much volunteer assistance and was apt to suppress it with scanty ceremony so his choice of a posse was accepted without protest or comment and the chosen four slipped off to get their guns as tug blackstock had foreseen the trail of the fugitive was easily picked up confident in his powers as a runaway black dan's sole object at first had been to gain as much lead as possible over the expected pursuit and he had run straight ahead leaving a trail which any one of blackstock's posse with the exception perhaps of big andy could have followed with almost the speed and precision of the deputy himself there had been no attempt at concealment about five miles back however in the heavy woods beyond the head of the lake it appeared that the fugitive had dropped into a walk and begun to go more circumspectly the trail now grew so obscure that the other woodsmen would have had difficulty in deciphering it at all and they were amazed at the ease and confidence with which blackstock followed it up hardly diminishing his stride tug is sure some trailer commented jackson his good humor now quite restored by the progress they were making jim couldn't have done no better himself declared big andy the orm nocto man and just then blackstock came abruptly to a halt and held up his hand for his followers to stop steady boys stop right where you are and don't step out of your tracks he commanded the four stood rigid and began searching the ground all about them with keen initiated eyes oh i've got him so fur all right continued blackstock pointing to a particularly clear and heavy impression of a boot sole close behind his own feet but here it stops it don't appear to go any further he knelt down to examine the footprint 
perhaps he's doubled back on his tracks to throw us off suggested saunders who was himself an expert on the trails of all the wild creatures no replied blacksop i've watched out for that sharp perhaps he's give a big jump to one side or t'other to break his trail said macdonald no said blackstock with decision nor that neither mac this here print is even if he'd jump to one side or the other it would be dug in on that side and if he's jumped forward it would be hard down at the toe it fair beats me stepping carefully foot by foot he examined the ground minutely over a half circle of a dozen yards to his front he sent out his followers all but big andy who being no trailer was bidden to stand fast to either side and to the rear crawling like ferrets and interrogating every grass tuft in vain the trail had simply stopped with that one footprint it was as if black dan had dissolved into a miasma and floated off at last blackstock called the party in and around the solitary footprint they all sat down and smoked one after another they made suggestions but each suggestion had its futility revealed and sealed by a stony stare from blackstock and was no more befriended by its author at last blackstock rose to his feet and gave a hitch to his belt i don't mind telling you boys said he it beats me fair but one thing's plain enough black dan ain't here and he ain't likely to come here lookin for us spread out now and we'll work on ahead and see if we can't pick up something you big andy you keep right along behind me there's an explanation to everything and we'll find this out afore long or my name's dennis over the next three or four hundred yards however nothing of significance was discovered by any of the party then breaking through a dense screen of branches blackstock came upon the face of a rocky knoll so steep at that point that hands and feet together would be needed to climb it casting his eyes upwards he saw what looked like the entrance to a little cave a whistle brought the rest of the party to his side a cave always holds possibilities if nothing else blackstock spread his men out again at intervals of three or four paces and all went cautiously up the steep converging on the entrance blackstock in the centre shielding himself behind knob of rock peered in the place was empty it was hardly a cave indeed being little more than a shallow recess beneath an overhanging ledge but it was well sheltered by a great branch which trekked upwards across the opening blackstock sniffed critically a bear's den he announced stepping in and scrutinizing the floor the floor was naked rock scantily littered with dead leaves and twigs these blackstock concluded had been recently disturbed but he could find no clue to what had disturbed them from the further side however to blackstock's right a palpable trail worn clear of moss and herbage led off by a narrow ledge across the face of the knoll half a dozen paces further on the rock ended in a stretch of stiff soil here the trail declared itself it was unmistakably that of a bear and unmistakably also a fresh trail waving the rest to stop where they were blackstock followed the clear trail down from the knoll and for a couple of hundred yards along the level going very slowly and searching it hawk-eyed for some sign other than that of bear at length he returned looking slightly crestfallen not at all but bear he announced in an injured voice but that bear seemed to have been in a bit of a hurry as if he was gettin out of somebody's way black dan's way it's dollars to doughnuts but where was black dan that's what i want to know if you don't know tug said macdonald who can know jim said the deputy rubbing his lean chin and biting off a big chaw of blackjack jim sure some dog agreed macdonald that was the only fool thing i ever knowed you to do tug sendin jim after black dan that way blackstock swore softly and intensely though he was a man not given to that form of self-expression boys said he i used to fancy myself quite a lot but now i begin to think nipsiwaska county would do better by gettin a new deputy and i ain't no matter o good the men looked at him in frank astonishment he had never before been seen in this mood of self-depreciation 
ah oh, shucks exclaimed long jackson presently there ain't a man from here to the st lawrence as can teach ye and you know it tug quit your jollyin now i believe you got something up your sleeve only you won't say so at this expression of unbounded confidence blackstock braced up visibly well boys there's one thing i can do said he i'm going back to get jim and if i have to fetch him in a wheelbarrow we'll find out what he thinks of the situation i'll take saunders and big andy with me you long and mac you stop on here and lay low and see what turns up but don't go messin up the trails two jim proved to be so far recovered that he was able to hobble about a little on three legs the fourth being skilfully bandaged so that he could not put his foot to the ground it was obvious however that he could not make a journey through the woods and be any use whatever at the end of it blackstock therefore knocked together a handy litter for his benefit and with very ill grace jim submitted to being borne upon it some twenty paces from that solitary boot print which marked the end of black dan's trail jim was set free from his litter and his attention directed to a bruised tuft of moss seek him said blackstock the dog gave one sniff and then with a growl of anger the hair lifted along his back and he limped forward hurriedly he's got it in for black dan now remarked macdonald and the whole party followed with hopeful expectation so great was their faith in jim's sagacity the dog in his haste overshot the end of the trail he stopped abruptly whined sniffed about and came back to the deep boot print all about it he circled whimpering with impatience but never going more than a dozen feet away from it then he returned sniffed long and earnestly and stood over it with drooping tail evidently quite nonplussed he don't appear to make no more of it than you did tuck said long jackson much disappointed oh give him time long retorted blackstock then seek him seek him good boy he repeated waving jim to the front running with amazing briskness on his three sound legs the dog began to quarter the undergrowth in ever widening half circles while the men stood waiting and watching at last at a distance of several hundred yards he gave a yelp and a growl and sprang forward got it exclaimed big andy guess it's only the trail of that there bar he struck suggested jackson pessimistically jim stop ordered blackstock and the dog stood rigid in his tracks while blackstock hastened forward to see what he had found sure enough it's only the bear cried blackstock investigating the great footprint over which jim was standing come along back here jim and don't go foolin away your time over a bear just now the dog sniffed at the trail gave another hostile growl and reluctantly followed his master back blackstock made him smell the boot print again then he said with emphasis black dan jim it's black dan we're wantin seek him boy fetch him jim started off on the same manoeuvres as before and at the same point as before he again gave a growl and a yelp and bounded forward jim shouted the deputy angrily come back here the dog came limping back looking puzzled what do you mean by that foolin went on his master severely what's bears to you smell that and he pointed again to the boot print it's black dan you're after jim hung upon his words but looked hopelessly at sea as to his meaning he turned and gazed wistfully in the direction of the bear's trail he seemed on the point of starting out for it again but the tone of blackstock's rebuke withheld him finally he sat down upon his dejected tail and stared upwards into a great tree one of whose lower branches stretched directly over his head blackstock followed his gaze the tree was an ancient rock maple its branches large but comparatively few in number blackstock could see clear to its top it was obvious that the tree could afford no hiding-place to anything larger than a wildcat nevertheless as blackstock studied it a gleam of sudden insight passed over his face jim pears to think black dan's gone to heaven remarked saunders dryly you can't always tell what jim's thinkin retorted blackstock but i'll bet it's a clever idea he's got in his black head whatever it is he scanned the tree anew and the other trees nearest whose branches interlaced with it then with a sharp come on jim he started towards the knoll eyeing the branches overhead as he went 
the rest of the party followed at a discreet distance crippled as he was jim could not climb the steep face of the knoll but his master helped him up the instant he entered the cave he growled savagely and once more the stiff hair rose along his back blackstock watched in silence for a moment he had never before noticed on jim's part any special hostility toward bears whom he was quite accustomed to trailing he glanced up at the big branch that overhung the entrance and conviction settled on his face then he whispered sharply seek him jim and jim set off at once as fast as he could limp along the trail of the bear come on boys called blackstock to his posse if we can't find black dan we may as well have a little bear hunt to fill in the time jim appears to have a particular grudge agin that bear the men closed up eagerly expecting to find that blackstock with jim's help had at last discovered some real signs of black dan when they saw that there was still nothing more than that old bear's trail which they had already examined long jackson began to grumble we can have bear any day he growled i guess tug ain't no keener after bear this day than you be commented macdonald he got something up his sleeve you see maybe it's a tame bar and a trained bar and black dan's a ridin him horseback suggested big andy blackstock who was close at jim's heels a few paces ahead of the rest turned with one of his rare ruminative laughs that's quite an idea of yours andy he remarked stooping to examine one of those great clawed footprints in a patch of soft soil but even trained bar ain't got wings commented macdonald again and there's a good three hundred yards atween the spot where black dan's trail peters out and the nearest bar track i guess your interest in hypotheses don't quite fill the bill eh andy anyways protested the big orambocto man you'll all notice one thing queer about this here bar track it goes straight mostly a bar will go wanderin off this way and that to nose at an old root and grub up a bed of toadstools but this bar keeps right on as if he had important business somewhere straight ahead that's just the way he go as someone was a ridin him horseback andy had advanced his proposition as a joke but now he was inclined to take it seriously and to defend it with warmth well said long jackson we'll all chip in when we get our money back and buy you a bear andy and you shall ride it up every day from the mills to the post office it'll save you quite a few minutes in getting to the post office it don't matter about your getting away the big oromocto lad blushed but laughed good-naturedly he was so much in love with the little widow who kept the post office that nothing pleased him more than to be teased about her for the deputy's trained eyes as for jim's trained nose that bear track was an easy one to follow nevertheless progress was slow for blackstock would halt from time to time to interrogate some claw print with special minuteness and from time to time jim would stop to lie down and lick gingerly at his bandage tormented by the aching of his wound late in the afternoon when the level shadows were black upon the trail and the trailing had come to depend entirely on jim's nose blackstock called a halt on the banks of a small brook and all sat down to eat their bread and cheese then they sprawled about smoking for the deputy apparently regarding the chase as a long one was now in no great hurry jim lay on the wet sand close to the brook's edge while blackstock scooping up the water in double handfuls let it fall in an icy stream on the dog's bandaged leg have you got any real id to come and go on tug demanded long jackson at last blowing a long slow jet of smoke from his lips and watching it spiral upwards across a bar of light just over his head i have said blackstock and air you sure it's a good one good enough to drag his way out here on persisted jackson i'm bankin on it answered blackstock and so's jim i'm thinkin suggested macdonald tentatively jim's idea and mine ain't the same exactly vouchsafed blackstock after a pause but i guess they'll come to the same thing in the end they're fittin in with each other fine so fur well you bet that you're not mistaken now both of yous demanded jackson Year wages for the whole summer answered blackstock promptly long looked satisfied he knocked the ashes out of his pipe and proceeded to refill it oh if you're so sure as that tug he drawled i guess i ain't taken any this time 
for a couple of hours after sunset the party continued to follow the trail depending now entirely upon jim's leadership the dog revived by his rest and his master's cold water treatment limped forward at a good pace growling from time to time as a fresh pang in his wound reminded him anew of his enemy how jim pears to hate that bear remarked big andy once he does that agreed blackstock and he's going to get his own back too i'm thinking afore long presently the moon rose round and yellow through the treetops and the going became less laborious jim seemed untiring now he pressed on so eagerly that blackstock concluded the object of his vindictive pursuit whatever it was must be now not far ahead another hour and the party came out suddenly upon the bank of a small pond jim his nose to earth started to lead the way around it towards the left but blackstock stopped him and halted his party in the dense shadows the opposite shore was in the full glare of the moonlight there close to the water's edge stood a little log hut every detail of it standing out as clearly as in daylight it was obviously old but the roof had been repaired with new bark and poles and the door was shut instead of sagging half open on broken hinges after the fashion of the doors of deserted cabins blackstock slipped a leash from his pocket and clipped it on to jim's collar i'm thinking boys we'll get some information yonder about that bear if we go the right way about inquiring now saunders you go round the pond to the right and steal up along shore through the bushes to within forty paces of the hut you mac and big andy you two go round same way but get will back into the timber and come up behind the hut to within about the same distance there'll be a winder on that side likely when you're in a position give the call of the big horned owl not too loud and when i answer with the same call twice then close in but keep a good-sized tree atween you and the winder for you never know what a bear can do when he's trained i'll bet big andy's seen bears that could shoulder a gun like a man so look out for yourselves long and jim and me will follow the trail of the bear right around to this end of the pond and if i'm not mistaken it'll lead us right up to the door of that there hut some bears have a taste in regard to where they sleep as noiselessly as shadows the party melted away in opposite directions the pond lay smooth as glass under the flooding moonlight reflecting a pale star or two where the moon-path grudgingly gave it space after some fifteen minutes a lazy muffled hooting floated across the pond five minutes later the same call the very voice of the wilderness at midnight came from the deep of the woods behind the hut blackstock with jackson close behind him and jim pulling eagerly on the leash was now within twenty yards of the hut door but hidden behind a thick young fir tree he breathed the call of the horned owl a mellow musical call which nevertheless brings terror to all the small creatures of the wilderness and then after a pause repeated it softly he waited for a couple of minutes motionless his keen ears caught the snapping of a twig close behind the hut big andy's big feet that time he muttered to himself that boy'll never be much good on the trail then leaving jem to the care of jackson he slipped forward to another and bigger tree not more than a dozen paces from the cabin standing close in the shadow of the trunk and drawing his revolver he called sharply as a gunshot damn black instantly there was a thud within the hut as of some one leaping from a bunk dan black repeated the deputy the game's up i've got you surrounded will you come out quietly and give yourself up or do you want trouble well no i guess i don't want no more trouble drawled a cool voice from within the hut i guess i've got enough of my own already i'll come out tug the door was flung open and black dan with his hands held up stalked forth into the moonlight with a roar jim sprang out from behind the fir tree dragging long jackson with him by the sudden violence of his rush down jim down ordered blackstock lay down and shut up and jim grumbling in his throat allowed jackson to pull him back by the collar blackstock advanced and clicked the handcuffs on to black dan's wrists then he took the revolver and knife from the prisoner's belt and motioned him back into the hut be am pretty late now said blackstock i guess we'll accept your hospitality for the rest of the night 
right you are tug assented dan you'll find tea and merlasses and a bite of bacon in the cupboard yonder as the rest of the party came in black dan nodded to them cordially a greeting which they returned with more or less sheepish grins excuse me if i don't shake hands with you boys said he but tug here says the state of my health makes it bad for me to use me arms and he held up the handcuffs no apologies needed said macdonald last of all came in long jackson with jim blackstock slipped the leash and the dog lay down in a corner as far from the prisoner as he could get in a few minutes the whole party were sitting about the tiny stove drinking boiled tea and munching crackers and molasses the prisoner joining in the feast as well as his manacled hands would permit at length with his mouth full of cracker the deputy remarked that was clever of you dan durn clever i didn't know it was in you not half so clever as you seein through it the way you did tug responded the prisoner handsomely and darned if i see through it now protested big andy in a plaintive voice it's just about as clear as mud to me where's your wings dan and where in tarnation is that bar the prisoner laughed triumphantly long jackson and the others looked relieved the oromoco man having propounded the question which they had been ashamed to ask it's just this way exclaimed blackstock when we'd puzzled jim yonder and he was puzzled at us being such fools you'll recollect he sat down on his tail by that boot print and tried to work out what we wanted of him i was telling him to seek black dan and yet i was calling him back off that there bear track he could smell black dan in the bear track but we couldn't so we was doing the best we could to mix him up well he looked up into the big maple overhead then i saw where black dan had gone to he'd jumped that's why the boot print was so heavy and caught that there branch and swung himself up into the tree then he worked his way along from tree to tree till he come to the cave i saw by the way jim took on in the cave that black dan had been there all right for jim ain't got no special grudge agin bear says i to myself if jim smells black dan in that bear trail then black dan must be in it that's all then it comes over me that i'd once seen a big bearskin in dan's room at the mills and as the picture of it come again in my mind i noticed how the forepaws and legs of it were missing with that i looked again at the trail as we went along jim and me and sure enough in all of them tracks there wasn't one print of a hind paw they were all forepaws smart very smart of dan says i to myself let's see them ingenious socks of yours dan ah they're in the top bunk yonder said black dan with a weary air and my belt and pouch containing the other stuff that's all in the bunk too i may as well save you the trouble of looking for it as you'll find it anyways i was sure you'd never succeed in tracking me down so i didn't bother to hide it and i see now you wouldn't a got me tug if it hadn't a been for jim that's where i made the mistake of my life not stopping to make sure i'd done jim up no dan said blackstock you're wrong there if you'd done jim up i'd have caught you just the same in the long run for i'd never have quit the trail till i did get you and when i got you well i'd have forgot myself maybe and only remembered that you'd killed my best friend if you'd had as many lives as a cat dan there wouldn't have been enough to pay for that dog end of story one part four story one of jim the story of a backwoods police dog and other stories by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain story one part five the fire at brine's rip mills when pretty mary farrell came to brine's rip and set up a modest dressmaker's shop quite close to the mills she said she loved the sound of the saws all the unattached males of the village to say nothing of too many of the attached ones fell instant victims to her charms they were her slaves from the first lifting of her long lashes in their direction tug blackstock the deputy sheriff to be sure did not capitulate quite so promptly as the rest mary had to flash her dark blue eyes upon him at least twice dropping them again with shy admiration then he was at her feet which was a pleasant place to be seeing that those same small feet were shod with a neatness which was a perpetual reproach to the untidy sawdust strewn roadways of brine's rip 
even big andy the boyish young giant from the oromocto wavered for a few hours in his allegiance to the postmistress but mary was much too tactful to draw upon her pretty shoulders the hostility of such a power as the postmistress and big andy's enthusiasm was cold douched in its first glow as for the women-folk of brine's rip it was not to be expected that they should agree any too cordially with the men on the subject of mary farrell but one instance of mary's tact made even the most irreconcilable of her own sex sheathe their claws in dealing with her she had come from harner's bend the mills at harner's bend were anathema to brine's rip mills a keen trade rivalry had grown up fed by a series of petty but exasperating incidents into a hostility that blazed out on the least occasion and pretty mary had come from harner's bend brine's rip did not find it out till mary's spell had been cast and secured of course but the fact was a bitter one to swallow no one else but mary farrell could have made brine's rip swallow it one day big andy greatly daring and secure in his renovated allegiance to the postmistress ventured to chaff mary about it she turned upon him half amused and half indignant well she demanded isn't harner's bend a good place to come away from do you think i'd ought to have stopped there do i look like the kind of girl that wouldn't come away from harner's bend and me a dressmaker i just couldn't live let alone make a livin among such a dowdy lot of women folk as they've got over there it isn't dresses they want but oat sacks and you wouldn't know the difference either when they've got em on the implication was obvious and the women of brine's rip began to allow for possible virtues in miss farrell the postmistress declared there was no harm in her and even admitted that she might almost be called good-looking if she hadn't such an awful big mouth i have said that all the male folk of brine's rip had capitulated immediately to the summons of mary farrell's eyes but there were two notable exceptions woolly billy and jim both woolly billy's flaxen mop of curls and the great curly black head of jim the dog had turned away coldly from mary's first advances woolly billy preferred men to women anyhow and jim was jealous of tug blackstock's devotion to the petticoated stranger but mary farrell knew how to manage children and dogs as well as men she ignored both jim and woolly billy she did it quite pointedly yet with a gracious politeness that left no room for resentment neither the child nor the dog was accustomed to being ignored before long mary's amiable indifference began to make them feel as if they were being left out in the cold they began to think they were losing something because she did not notice them reluctantly at first but by and by with eagerness they courted her attention at last they gained it it was undeniably pleasant from that moment the child and the dog were at mary's well-shod and self-reliant little feet Two as summer wore on into autumn the dry weather turned to a veritable drought and all the streams ran lower and lower word came early that the mills at harner's bend over in the next valley had been compelled to shut down for lack of logs but brine's rip exulted unkindly the autonunas fed by a group of cold spring lakes maintained a steady flow there were plenty of logs and the mills had every prospect of working full time all through the autumn presently they began to gather in big orders which would have gone otherwise to harner's bend brine's rip not only exulted but took into itself merit it felt that it must on general principles have deserved well of providence for providence so obviously to take sides with it as august drew to a dusty choking end mary farrell began to collect her accounts her tact and sympathy made this easy for her and women paid up civilly enough who had never been known to do such a thing before unless at the point of a summons mary said she was going to the states perhaps as far as new york itself to renew her stock and study up the latest fashions every one was much interested woolly billy's eyes brimmed over at the prospect of her absence but he was consoled by the promise of her speedy return with an air-gun and also a toy steam-engine that would really go 
as for jim his feathery black tail drooped in premonition of a loss but he could not gather exactly what was afoot he was further troubled by an unusual depression on the part of tug blackstock the deputy sheriff seemed to have lost his zest in tracking down evildoers it was nearing ten o'clock on a hot and starless night tug blackstock too restless to sleep wandered down to the silent mill with jim at his heels as he approached jim suddenly went bounding on ahead with a yelp of greeting he fawned upon a small shadowy figure which was seated on a pile of deals close to the water's edge tug blackstock hurried up you here mary all alone at this time of night he exclaimed i come here often answered mary making room for him to sit beside her i wish i'd known it sooner muttered the deputy i like to listen to the rapids and catch glimpses of the water slipping away blindly in the dark said mary it helps one not to think she added with a faint catch in her voice why should you not want to think mary protested blackstock how dreadfully dry everything is replied mary irrelevantly as if heading blackstock off what if there should be a fire at the mill wouldn't the whole village go like a box of matches people might get caught asleep in their beds oh oughtn't there to be more than one night watchman in such dry weather as this i've so often heard of mills catching fire though i don't see why they should any more than houses mills most generally get set afire answered the deputy grimly think what it would mean to harner's bend if these mills should get burnt down now it would mean thousands and thousands to them but you're dead right mary about the danger to the village only it depends on the wind this time of year and as long as it keeps dry what wind there is blows mostly away from the houses so sparks and brands would just be carried out over the river but if the wind should shift to the southard or thereabouts yes there'd be more watchmen needed i suppose you're thinking about your shop while you're away i was thinking about woolly billy said mary gravely what do i care about the old shop it's insured anyway i'll look out for woolly billy answered blackstock and i'll look out for the shop whether you care about it or not it's yours and your name's on the door and anything of yours anything you've touched and wherever you put your little foot that's something for me to care about i ain't no hand at makin pretty speeches mary or payin compliments but i tell you these here old sawdust roads are just wonderful to me now because your little feet have walked on em if only i could think that you could care that i had anything was anything mary worth offerin you he had taken her hand and she had yielded it to him he had put his great arm around her shoulders and drawn her to him and for a moment with a little shiver she had leant against him almost cowered against him with the air of a frightened child craving protection but as he spoke on in his quiet strong voice she suddenly tore herself away sprang off to the other end of the pile of deals and began to sob violently he followed her at once but she thrust out both hands go away please don't come near me she appealed somewhat wildly you don't understand anything tug blackstock looked puzzled he seated himself at a distance of several inches and clasped his hands resolutely in his lap of course i won't touch you mary said he if you don't want me to i don't want to do anything you don't want me to never mary but i sure don't understand what you're crying for please don't i'm so sorry i touched you dear but if you knew how i love you how i would give my life for you i think you'd forgive me mary mary gave a bitter little laugh and choked her sobs it isn't that oh no it isn't that she said i i liked it there she panted then she sprang to her feet and faced him and in the gloom he could see her eyes flaming with some intense excitement from a face ghost white but i won't let you make me love you doug blackwell i won't i won't i won't let you change all my plans all my ambitions i won't give up all i've worked for and schemed for and sold my very soul for just because at last i've met a real man oh i'd soon spoil your life no matter how much you love me you'd soon find how cruel and hard and selfish i am and i'd ruin my own life too do you think i could settle down to spend my life in the backwoods do you think i have no dreams beyond the spruce woods of nipsiwasa county do you think you could imprison me in brine's rip 
i'd either kill your brave clean soul tug blackstock or i'd kill myself utterly bewildered at this incomprehensible outburst blackstock could only stammer lamely but, but I, I thought you kind of liked brine's rip like it the uttermost of scorn was in her voice i hate 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 it i just live to get into the great world where i feel that i belong but i must have money first and i'm going to study and i'm going to make myself somebody i wasn't born for this and she waved her hand with a sweep that took in all the backwoods world i'm getting out of it it would drive me mad oh i sometimes think it has already driven me half mad her tense voice trailed off wearily and she sat down again this time further away blackstock sat quite still for a time at last he said gently i do understand you now mary you don't interrupted mary i felt all along i was somehow not good enough for you you're a million miles too good for me she interrupted again energetically but he went on without heeding the protest i hoped somehow that i might be able to make you happy and that's what i want more than anything else in the world all i have is at your feet mary and i could make it more in time but i'm not a big enough man for you i'm all yours and always will be but i can't make myself no more than i am yes you could tug blackstock she cried real men are scarce in the great world and everywhere you could make yourself a master anywhere if only you would tear yourself loose from here he sprang up and his arms went out as if to seize her but with an effort he checked himself and dropped them stiffly to his side i'm too old to change my spots mary said he i'm stamped for good and all i am some good here i be no good there and i won't never rest being a drag on your plans you could you could urged mary almost desperately but he turned away with his lips set hard not daring to look at her if ever you get tired of it all out there and your own kind calls you back as it will bein in your blood i'll be waitin for you mary whatever happens he strode off quickly up the shore the girl stared after him till he was quite out of sight then buried her face in the fur of jim who had willingly obeyed a sign from his master and remained at her side oh my dear if only you could have dared she murmured at last she jumped up with an air of resolve and wandered off apparently aimlessly into the recesses of the mill with one hand resting firmly on jim's collar three two days later mary farrell left brine's rip she hugged and kissed woolly billy very hard before she left and cried a little with him pretending to laugh and she took her three big trunks with her in the long-bodied express wagon which carried the mails although she said she would not be gone more than a month at the outside tug blackstock eyed these three trunks with a sinking heart his only comfort was that he had in his pocket the key of mary's little shop which she had sent to him by woolly billy when the express wagon had rattled and bumped away out of sight there was a general feeling in brine's rip that the whole place had gone flat like stale beer and the saws did not seem to make as cheerful a shrieking as before and black saunders expert runner of logs as he was fell in because he forgot to look where he was going and knocked his head heavily in falling and was almost drowned before they could fish him out there's gonna be some bad luck comin to brine rip before long remarked long jackson in a voice of deepest pessimism it's come long said the deputy that same day the wind changed and blew steadily from the mills right across the village but it brought no change in the weather except a few light showers that did no more than lay the surface dust about a week later it shifted back again and blew steadily away from the village and straight across the river and once more a single night watchman was regarded as sufficient guard against fire a little before daybreak on the second night following this change of wind the watchman was startled by a shrill scream and a heavy splash from the upper end of the great pool where the logs were gathered before being fed up in the saws it sounded like a woman's voice as fast as he could stumble over the intervening deals and rubbish he made his way to the spot waving his lantern and calling anxiously there was no sign of any one in the water 
as he searched he became conscious of a ruddy light at one corner of the mill he turned and dashed back yelling fire fire at the top of his lungs a similar ruddy light was spreading upward in two other corners of the mill frantically he turned on the nearest chemical extinguisher yelling madly all the while but he was already too late the flames were licking up the dry wood with furious appetite in almost as little time as it takes to tell of it the whole great structure was ablaze with all brine's rip in every varying stage of dishabille out gaping at it the little hand-fire engine worked heroically squirting a futile stream upon the flames for a while and then turning its attention to the nearest houses in order to keep them drenched thank god the wind's in the right direction muttered jeb smith the storekeeper and magistrate and the pious ejaculation was echoed fervently through the crowd in the meantime tug blackstock seeing that there was nothing to do in the way of fighting the fire the mill being already devoured was interviewing the distracted watchman sure he agreed it was a trick to get you away long enough for the fires to get a start somebody yelled and chucked in a big stick that's all and of course you run to help you couldn't naturally do nothing else the watchman heaved a huge sigh of relief if blackstock exonerated him from the charge of negligence other people would and his heart had been very heavy at being so fatally fooled it's harner's bend all right that's what it is he muttered if only we could prove it said blackstock searching the damp ground around the edges of the pool which was lighted now as by day presently he saw jim sniffing excitedly at some tracks he hurried over to examine them jim looked up at him and wagged his tail as much as to say so you found them too interesting ain't they what do you make of that demanded blackstock of the watchman boys tracks sure said the latter at once the footprints were small and neat they were of a double-soled larrigan with a low heel of a single welt none of our boys said blackstock wear a larrigan like that especially this time of year one could run light in that larrigan and the soles thick enough to save the foot and it's good for a canoe too he rubbed his chin thinking hard yesterday said the watchman i mind seeing a young half-breed he looked like a slip of a lad very dark complected crossing the road half a mile up yonder he was out of sight in a second like a shatter but i mind noticing he had on larrigans and a brown slouch hat down over his eyes and a dark red handkerchief round his neck it was a stranger in these parts that would account for the voice like a woman's said blackstock following the tracks till they plunged through a tangle of tall bush and here's the handkerchief he added triumphantly grabbing up a dark red thing that fluttered from a branch harner's ben knows something about that boy i'm thinking now bill you go along back and don't say nothing about this mind me and jim will look into it tell old mrs amos and woolly billy not to fret we'll be back soon he slipped the leash into jim's collar gave him the red handkerchief to smell and said seek him jim and jim set off eagerly tugging at the leash because the trail was so fresh and plain to him and he hated to be held back the trail led around behind the village and back to the river bank about a mile below there it followed straight down the shore it was evident to blackstock that his quarry would have a canoe in hiding some distance further down there was no time to be lost it was now almost full daybreak and he could follow the trail by himself after all it was only a boy he had to deal with he could trust jim to delay him to hold him at bay he loosed the leash and jim bounded forward at top speed he himself followed at a leisurely loping stride as he trotted on thinking of many things he took out the red handkerchief and examined it again he smelt it curiously his nose was keen like a wild animal's as he sniffed a pang ran through him clutching at his heart he sniffed again his long stride shortened he dropped into a walk he thought over word by word his conversation with mary that night beside the mill his face went gray after a brief struggle he shouted to jim trying to call him back but the eager dog was already far beyond hearing then blackstock broke into a desperate run shouting from time to time he thought of jim's ferocity when on the trail meanwhile the figure of a slim boy very light of foot 
was speeding far down the river bank clutching a brown slouch hat in one hand as he ran he had an astonishing crop of hair wound in tight coils about his head he was panting heavily and seemed nearly spent at last he halted drew a deep sigh of relief pressed his hands to his heart and plunged into a clump of bushes in the depth of the bushes lay a small birch-bark canoe carefully concealed he tugged at it but for the moment he was too weary to lift it he flung himself down beside it to take breath in the silence his ears caught the sound of light feet padding down the shore he jumped up and peered through the bushes a big black dog was galloping on his trail he drew a long knife and his mouth set itself so hard that the lips went white the dog reached the edge of the bushes the youth slipped behind the canoe jim said he softly the dog whined wagged his tail and plunged in through the bushes the youth's stern lips relaxed he slipped the knife back into its sheath and fondled the dog which was fawning upon him eagerly you'd never go back on me would you jim no matter what i'd done said he in a gentle voice then with an expert twist of his lithe young body he shouldered the canoe and bore it down to the water's edge one of his swarthy hands had suddenly grown much whiter where jim had been licking it before stepping into the canoe this peculiar youth took a scrap of paper from his shirt pocket and an envelope he scribbled something sealed it up addressed the envelope marked it private and gave it to jim who took it in his mouth give that to tug blackstock ordered the youth clearly then he kissed the top of jim's black head pushed off and paddled away swiftly down the river jim proud of his commission set off up the shore at a gallop to meet his master half a mile back he met him blackstock snatched the letter from jim's mouth praising heaven that the dog had for once failed in his duty he tore open the letter it said yes i did it i had to do it but you could have saved me if you dared for i do love you tug blackstock mary a month later a parcel came from new york for woolly billy containing an air gun and a toy steam engine that would really go but it contained no address and brine's rip said that tug blackstock had been bested for once because he never succeeded in finding out who burnt down the mills end of story one part five story one of jim the story of a backwoods police dog and other stories by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain story one part six the man with the dancing bear one one day there arrived at brand's rip mills driving in a smart trap which looked peculiarly unsuited to the rough backwoods road an imposing gentleman who wore a dark green homburg hat heavy tan gauntleted gloves immaculate linen shining boots and a well-fitting morning suit of dark pepper and salt protected from the contaminations of travel by a long fawn-coloured dust coat he also wore a monocle so securely screwed up into his left eye that it looked as if it had been born there his red and black wheels labouring noiselessly through the sawdust of the village road he drove up to the front door of the barn-like wooden structure which staggered under the name in huge letters of the continental hotel there was no one in sight to hold the horse so he sat on the trap and waited with severe impatience for some one to come out to him in a few moments the landlord strolled forth in his shirt-sleeves chewing tobacco and inquired casually what he could do for his visitor i'm looking for mr blackstock mr j t blackstock said the stranger with lofty politeness will you be so good as to direct me to him the landlord spat thoughtfully into the sawdust to show that he was not unduly impressed by the stranger's appearance you'll find him down to the forder end of the cross street yonder he answered pointing with his thumb last house towards the river lives with old mrs amos him and woolly billy the stranger found it without difficulty and halted his trap in front of the door before he could alight a tall rather gaunt woodsman with kind but piercing eyes and brows knitted in an habitual concentration appeared in the doorway and gave him courteous greeting mr blackstock i presume 
the deputy sheriff i should say returned the stranger with extreme affability descending from the trap the same assented blackstock stepping forward to hitch the horse to a fence post a big black dog came from the house and ignoring the resplendent stranger went up to blackstock's side to superintend the hitching a slender little boy with big china blue eyes and a shock of pale flaxen curls followed the dog from the house and stopped to stare at the visitor the latter swept the child with a glance of scrutiny swift and intent then turned to his host i am extraordinarily glad to meet you mr blackstock he said holding out his hand if as i surmise the name of this little boy here is master george harold manners watson then i owe you a debt of gratitude which nothing can repay i hear that you not only saved his life but have been as a father to him ever since the death of his own unhappy father blackstock's heart contracted he accepted the stranger's hand cordially enough but was in no hurry to reply at last he said slowly yes stranger you've got woolly billy's real name all o k but why should you thank me whatever i've done it's been for woolly billy's own sake ain't it billy for answer woolly billy snuggled up against his side and clutched his great brown hand adoringly while still keeping dubious eyes upon the stranger the latter took off his gloves laughing amiably well you see mr blackstock i'm only his uncle and his only uncle at that so i have a right to thank you and i see by the way the child clings to you how good you've been to him my name is j heathington johnson of heathington hall cramley blankshire i'm his mother's brother and i fear i shall have to tear him away from you in a great hurry too come inside mr johnson said blackstock and sit down we must talk this over a bit it is kind of sudden you see i don't want to seem unsympathetic said the visitor kindly and i know my little nephew is going to resent my carrying him off at these words woolly billy began to realize what was in the air and clung to blackstock with a storm of frightened tears but you will understand that i have to catch the next boat from new york and i have a thirty-mile drive before me now to the nearest railway station you know what the roads are so i'm sure you won't think me unreasonable if i ask you to get my nephew ready as soon as possible blackstock devoted a few precious moments to quieting the child's sobs before replying he remembered having found out in some way from some papers in the drowned englishman's pockets or somewhere that the name of woolly billy's mother before her marriage was not johnson but o'neill of course that discrepancy he realized might be easily explained but his quick suspicions sharpened by his devotion to the child were aroused we are not a rich family by any means mr blackstock continued the stranger after a pause but we have enough to be able to reward handsomely those who have befriended us all possible expense that my nephew may have been to you i want to reimburse you for at once and i wish also to make you a present as an expression of my gratitude not i assure you as a payment he added noticing that blackstock's face had hardened ominously he took out a thick bill-book well stuffed with bank-notes put away your money mr johnson said blackstock coldly i ain't taken any thank you for what i may have done for woolly billy but what i want to know is what authority have you to demand the child i'm his uncle his mother's brother answered the stranger sharply drawing himself up that may be and then again it mayn't said blackstock do you think i'm going to hand over the child to a perfect stranger just because he comes and says he's the child's uncle what proofs have you the visitor glared angrily but restrained himself and handed blackstock his card blackstock read it carefully what does that prove he demanded sarcastically it might not be your card and even if you are a mr johnson all right that's not proving that mr johnson is a little feller's uncle i want legal proof that would hold in a court of law you insolent blockhead exclaimed the visitor how dare you interfere between my nephew and me if you don't hand him over at once i will make you smart for it come child get your cap and coat and come with me immediately i have no more time to waste with this foolery my man and he stepped forward as if to lay hands on woolly billy blackstock interposed an inexorable shoulder the big dog growled and stiffened up the hair on his neck ominously 
look here said blackstock crisply you're going to get yourself into trouble before you go much further my lad you just mind your manners when you bring me them proofs i'll talk to you see he took willie billy's hand and turned towards the door the stranger's righteous indignation strangely enough seemed to have been allayed by this speech he followed eagerly don't be unreasonable mr blackstock he coached i'll send you the documents from my solicitors at once i'm sure you don't want to stand in the dear child's light this way and prevent him getting back to his own people and the life that is his right a day longer than is necessary do listen to reason now and he patted his wad of banknotes suggestively but at this stage woolly billy and the big dog having already entered the cottage blackstock followed and calmly shut the door you'll smart for this you ignorant clodhopper shouted mr headington johnson he clutched the door-knob but for all his rage prudence came to his rescue he did not turn the knob after a moment's hesitation he ground his heel upon the doorstep stalked back to his gig and drove off furiously the three at the window watched his going we won't see him back here again remarked the deputy he wasn't no uncle of yours woolly billy that same evening he wrote to a reliable firm of lawyers at exville telling them all he knew about woolly billy and woolly billy's father and also all he suspected and instructed them to look into the matter fully two several weeks went by and the imposing stranger as blackstock had anticipated failed to return with his proofs then came a letter from the lawyers at exville saying that they had something important to communicate and blackstock hurried off to see them planning to be away for about a week on the day following his departure to the delight of all the children and of most of the rest of the population as well there arrived at brand's rip mills a man with a dancing bear he was a black-eyed swarthy merry fellow with a most infectious laugh and besides his trained bear he possessed a peddler's pack containing all sorts of up-to-date odds and ends not by any means to be found in the very utilitarian miscellany of zeb smith's corner store he talked a rather musical but very broken lingo that passed for english flashing a mouthful of splendid white teeth as he did so he appeared to be an italian and the men of brine's rip christened him a dago at once there was no resisting his childlike bonhomie or the amiable antics of his great brown bear which grinned through its muzzle as if dancing to its master's merry piccolo were its one delight in life and the two did a roaring business from the moment they came strolling into brine's rip tony was what the laughing vagabond called himself and his bear answered to the name of peppo business being so good tony could afford to be generous and he was continually pressing peppermint lozenges upon the rabble of children who formed a triumphal procession for him wherever he moved when tony's eyes first fell on woolly billy standing just outside the crowd with one arm over the neck of the big black dog he was delighted come on here bambino come a quick he cried holding out some peppermints woolly billy liked him at once and adored the bear but was too shy or reserved to push his way through the other children so tony came to him leading the bear woolly billy stood his ground with a welcoming smile the big black dog growled doubtfully and then lost his doubts in curious admiration of the bear which plainly fascinated him woolly billy accepted the peppermints politely and put one into his mouth without delay then with an apologetic air the italian laid one finger softly on woolly billy's curls and drew back at once as if fearing he had taken a liberty jim likes the bear sir doesn't he suggested woolly billy to make conversation everybody he likes the bear him very good bear asserted the bear's master and laughed again giving the bear a peppermint and he is a very good bambino the bear he like a you very much that he shake a you hand good friends now encouraged by the warmth of his welcome the italian had from the first made a practice of dropping in at certain houses of the village just at meal times when he was received always with true backwoods hospitality on woolly billy's invitation he had come to the house of mrs amos the old lady too rheumatic to get about much out of doors was delighted with such a unique and amusing guest 
to all he said which indeed she never more than half understood she kept ejaculating well i never and did you ever hear the likes of that and the bear chained to the gate-post and devouring her pancakes and molasses thrilled her with a sense of furrin parts in fact there was no other house at brine's rip where tony and his bear were made more warmly welcome than at mrs amos the only member of the household who lacked cordiality was jim whose coolness towards tony however was fully counterbalanced by his interest in the bear towards tony his attitude was one of armed neutrality on the fourth evening after the arrival of tony and beppo jim discovered a most tempting lump of meat in the corner of mrs amos garden having something of an appetite at the moment he was just about to bolt the morsel but no sooner had he set his teeth into it than he conceived a prejudice against it he dropped it and sniffed at it intently the smell was quite all right he turned it over with his paw and sniffed at the underside no there was nothing the matter with it nevertheless his appetite had quite vanished well it might do for another time he dug a hole and buried the morsel and then went back to the house to see what woolly billy and mrs amos were doing a little later just as mrs amos was lighting the lamps in the kitchen the rattling of a chain was heard outside followed by the whimpering of beppo who objected to being tied up to the gate-post when he wanted to come in and beg for pancakes woolly billy ran to the door and peered forth into the dusk after a few moments tony entered all his teeth agleam in his expansive smile he had a little bag of bonbons for woolly billy something much more fascinating than peppermints which he doled out to the child one by one as a rare treat and for himself he wanted a cup of tea which hospitable mrs amos was only too eager to brew for him jim seeing that woolly billy was too interested to need his company got up and went out to inspect the bear tony was in gay spirits that evening in his broken english and helping out his meaning with eloquent gestures he told of adventures which made woolly billy's eyes as round as saucers and reduced mrs amos to admiring speechlessness he made mrs amos drink tea with him pouring it out for her himself while she hobbled about to find him something to eat and once in a while at tantalizing intervals he allowed woolly billy one more bonbon there was a chill in the night air so tony who was always politeness itself asked leave to close the door mrs amos hastened also to close the window or rather she tried to hasten but made rather a poor attempt and sat down heavily in the big armchair beside it my legs is that heavy she explained laughing apologetically so tony closed the window himself and at the same time drew the curtains then he went on talking but apparently his conversation was less interesting than it had been there came a snore from mrs amos big chair tony glanced aside at woolly billy as if expecting the child to laugh but woolly billy took no notice of the sound he was fast asleep his fluffy fair head fallen forward upon the red tablecloth tony looked at the clock on the mantelpiece it was not as late as he could have wished but he had observed that brine's rip went to bed early he turned the lamp low softly raised the window and looked out listening there were no lights in the village and all was silence save for the soft roar of the rip he extinguished the lamp and waited a few moments till his eyes got quite accustomed to the gloom at length he picked up the slight form of woolly billy who was now in a drugged stupor from which he would not wake for hours and slung him over his left shoulder in his right hand he grasped his short bear whip with its loaded butt he stepped noiselessly to the door listened a few moments and then opened it inch by inch with his left hand standing behind it and grasping the whip so as to be ready to strike with the butt he was wondering where the big black dog was the door was about half open when a black shape appearing suddenly launched itself at the opening the loaded butt came crashing down and jim dropped sprawling across the threshold from the back of the bear tony now unfastened a small pack and strapped it over his right shoulder 
then he unchained the great beast noiselessly and led it off to the waterside to a spot where a heavy log canoe was drawn up upon the beach he hauled the canoe down making much disarrangement in the gravel launched it thrust it far out into the water and noted it being carried away by the current he had no wish to journey by that route himself knowing that as soon as the crime was discovered which might chance at any moment the telephone would give the alarm all down the river next he undid the bear's chain and took off its muzzle and threw them both into the water knowing that when freed from these badges of servitude the animal would wander further and more freely at first the good-natured creature was unwilling to leave him its master from policy had always treated it kindly and fed it well and it was in no hurry to profit by its freedom however the man ordered it off towards the woods enforcing the command by a vigorous push and a stroke of the whip shaking itself till it realized its freedom it slouched away in a few paces downstream then turned into the woods the man listened to its careless crashing progress they'll find it easy following that trail he muttered with satisfaction assured that he had thus thrown out two false trails to distract pursuers the man now stepped into the water and walked upstream for several hundred yards till he reached the spot which served as a ferry landing here in the multiplicity of footprints he knew his own would be indistinguishable to even the keenest of backwood eyes he came ashore slipped through the slumbering village and plunged into the woods with the assurance of one to whom their mysteries were an open book he was shaping his course by the stars at present but by compass when it should become necessary for an inlet on the coast where there would be a sturdy fishing smack awaiting him and his rich prize all was working smoothly as most plans were apt to work under his swift resourceful hands and his hard lips relaxed in triumphant self-satisfaction one of the most accomplished and relentless of the desperadoes of the great northwest he had peculiarly enjoyed his pose as the childlike tony for hour after hour he pushed on till even his untiring sinews began to protest about the edge of dawn willy billy awoke but still stupid with the heavy drugging he had received he did not seem to realize what had happened he cried a little asking for jim and for tug blackstock and for mrs amos but was pacified by the most trivial excuses the man gave him some sweet biscuits but he refused to eat them leaving them on the moss beside him he hardly protested even when the man cut off his bright hair and proceeded to darken what was left with some queer-smelling dye when the man undressed him and proceeded to stain his face and his whole body he apparently thought he was being got ready for bed and to certain terrible threats as to what would happen if he tried to get away or to tell anyone anything he paid no attention whatever he went to sleep again in the middle of it all satisfied with his job the man lay down beside him knowing himself secure from pursuit and went to sleep himself meanwhile after lying motionless for several hours where he had dropped across the threshold jim at last began to stir that crashing blow after all had not fallen quite true jim was not dead by any means he staggered to his feet swayed a few moments and then for all the pain in his head he was practically himself again he went into the cottage tried in vain to awaken mrs amos in her chair hunted for willy billy in his bed and at last realizing something of what had happened rushed forth in a panic of rage and fear and grief and remorse for a trust betrayed it was a matter of a few minutes to trail the party down to the waterside then he darted off after the bear the latter grubbing delightedly in a rotten stump greeted him with a friendly woof a glance and a sniff satisfied jim that woolly billy was not there and his instinct assured him that the bear was void of offence in the whole matter he knew the enemy he darted back to the waterside ran on upstream to the ferry landing picked up the trail of tony's feet followed it unerringly through the confusion of other footprints and darted silently into the woods in pursuit 
at daybreak an early riser seeing the door of mrs amos's cottage standing open looked in and saw the old lady still asleep in her chair she was awakened with difficulty and could give but a vague account of what had happened the whole village turned out under the leadership of long jackson the big mill hand who constituted himself woolly billy's special guardian in blackstock's absence the dago and bear were traced down to the waterside of course it was clear to almost every one that the dago who was now due for lynching when caught had carried woolly billy off down river in the vanished canoe instantly the telephones were brought into service and half a dozen expert canoeists in the swiftest canoes to be had started off in pursuit but the more astute of the woodsmen including long jackson himself held that this river clue was a false one a ruse to put them off the track this group went after the bear in an hour or two they found him and very glad to see them he appeared to be he was getting hungry and a bit lonely so without waiting for an invitation with touching confidence he attached himself to the party and accompanied it back to the village there big andy who had always had a weakness for bears took him home and fed him and shut him up in the back yard in the meantime jim travelling at a speed that the fugitive could not hope to rival had come soon after daybreak to the spot where the man and woolly billy lay asleep he arrived as soundlessly as a shadow at sight of his enemy for he knew well who had carried off the child and who had dealt that almost fatal blow his long white fangs bared in a silent snarl of hate but he had learnt well learnt that this man was a dangerous antagonist he crouched stiffened as if to stone and surveyed the situation his sensitive nose prevented him from being quite deceived by the transformation in woolly billy's appearance he was puzzled by it but he had no doubt as to the child's identity having satisfied himself that the little fellow was asleep and therefore presumably safe for the moment he turned his attention to his enemy the man was sleeping almost on his back one arm thrown above his head his chin up his brown sinewy throat exposed that bare throat riveted jim's vengeful gaze he knew well that the man though asleep and at an utter disadvantage was the most dangerous adversary he could possibly tackle step by step so lightly so smoothly that not a twig crackled under his feet he crept up his muzzle outstretched his fangs gleaming the hair rising along his back when he was within a couple of paces of his goal the sleeper stirred slightly as if about to wake up or growing conscious of danger instantly jim sprang and sank his fangs deep deep into his enemy's throat with a shriek the sleeper awoke flinging wide his arms and legs convulsively but the shriek was strangled at its birth as jim's implacable teeth crunched closer the great dog shook his victim as a terrier shakes a rat there was a choked gurgle and the threshing arms and legs lay still jim continued his savage shaking till satisfied his foe was quite dead then he let go and turned his attention to woolly billy the child was sitting up staring at him with round eyes of question and bewilderment where am i jim he demanded then he gazed at the transformation in himself his clothes and his stained hands he saw his old clothes tossed aside his curls lying near them in a bright fluffy heap he felt his cropped head and then his brain began to clear he had a dim memory of the man cutting his hair and changing his clothes upon his first glimpse of the man lying there dead and covered with blood he felt a sharp pang of sorrow he had liked tony but the pang passed as he began to understand if jim had killed tony tony must have been bad it was evident that tony had carried him off and that jim had come to save him jim was licking his face now rapturously and evidently coaxing him to get up and come away he flung his arms around jim's neck then he saw the biscuits he divided them evenly between himself and jim and ate his portion with good appetite jim would not touch his share so woolly billy tucked them into his pocket 
then he got up and followed where jim was trying to lead him keeping his face averted from the terrible bleeding thing sprawled there upon the moss and jim led him safely home when tug blackstock two days later returned from his visit to exville he brought news which explained why a certain gang of criminals had planned to get possession of woolly billy the child had fallen heir to an immense property in england and an ancient title and he was to have been held for ransom from that moment blackstock never let him out of his sight until with a heavy heart he handed him over to his own people thereafter as he sat brooding on a log beside the noisy river with jim stretched at his feet tug blackstock felt that brine's rip for the lack of a childish voice and a head of flaxen curls had lost all savour for him and his thoughts turned more and more towards the arguments of a grey-eyed girl who had urged him to seek a wider sphere for his energies than the confines of nipsiwaska county could afford End of Story 1, Part 6 Story 2 of Jim, the Story of a Backwoods Police Dog, and Other Stories by Charles Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 2, The Eagle He sat upon the very topmost perch under the open-work dome of his spacious and lofty cage this perch was one of three or four lopped limbs jutting from a dead tree trunk erected in the centre of the cage a perch far other than that great branch of thunder-blasted pine out thrust from the seaward-facing cliff whereon he had been wont to sit in his own land across the ocean he sat with his snowy gleaming flat-crowned head drawn back between the dark shoulders of his slightly uplifted wings his black and yellow eyes unwinking bright and hard like glass stared out from under his overhanging brows with a kind of darting and defiant inquiry quite unlike their customary expression of tameless despair that dull world outside the bars of his cage that hated gaping inquisitive world which he had ever tried to ignore by staring at the sun or gazing into the deeps of sky overhead how it had changed since yesterday the curious crowds the gabbling voices were gone even the high buildings of red brick or whitish grey stone beyond the iron palings of the park were going toppling down with a slow dizzy lurch or leaping suddenly into the air with a roar and a huge belch of brown and orange smoke and scarlet flame here and there he saw men running wildly here and there he saw other men lying quite still sprawling inert shapes on the close-cropped grass or the white asphalted walks or the tossed pavement of the street he knew that these inert sprawling shapes were men and that the men were dead and the sight filled his exile heart with triumph men were his enemies his jailers his opponents and now at last he knew not how he was tasting vengeance the once smooth green turf around his cage was becoming pitted with strange yellow-brown holes these holes he had noticed always appeared after a burst of terrific noise and livid flame and coloured smoke followed by a shower of clods and pebbles and hard fragments which sometimes flew right through his cage with a vicious hum there was a deadly force in these humming fragments he knew it for his partner in captivity a golden eagle of the alps had been hit by one of them and now lay dead on the littered floor below him a mere heap of bloody feathers certain of the iron bars of the cage too had been struck and cut through as neatly as his own hooked beak could sever the paw of a rabbit the air was full of tremendous crashing buffeting sounds and sudden fierce gusts which forced him to tighten the iron grip of his talons upon the perch in the centre of the little park pond some fifty feet from his cage clustered a panic-stricken knot of eight or ten fancy ducks and two pairs of red-billed coot all that remained of the flock of water-birds which had formerly screamed and gabbled over the pool this little cluster was in a state of perpetual ferment those on the outside struggling to get into the centre those on the inside striving to keep their places 
from time to time one or two on the outer ring would dive under and force their way up in the middle of the press where they imagined themselves more secure but presently they would find themselves on the outside again whereupon in frantic haste they would repeat the manoeuvre the piercing glance of the eagle took in and dismissed this futile panic with immeasurable scorn with like scorn too he noted the three gaunt cranes which had been wont to stalk so arrogantly among the lesser fowl and uh, drive them from their meals these once domineering birds were now standing huddled their drooped heads close together beneath a dense laurel thicket just behind the cage their long legs quaking at every explosion amid all this destroying tumult and flying death the eagle had no fear he was merely excited by it if a fragment of shell sang past his head he never flinched his level stare never even filmed or wavered the roar and crash indeed and the monstrous bufferings of tormented air seemed to assuage the long ache of his homesickness they reminded him of the hurricane racing past his ancient pine of the giant waves shattering themselves with thunderous jar upon the cliffs below from time to time as if his nerves were straining with irresistible exultation he would lift himself to his full height half spread his wings stretch forward his gleaming white neck and give utterance to a short strident yelping cry then he would settle back upon his perch again and resume his fierce contemplation of the ruin that was falling on the city suddenly an eleven-inch shell dropped straight in the centre of the pool and exploded on the concrete bottom which underlay the mud half the pool went up in the colossal eruption of blown flame and steam and smoke even here on his perch the eagle found himself spattered and drenched when the shrunken surface of the pool had closed again over the awful vortex and the smoke had drifted off to join itself to the dark cloud which hung over the city the little flock of ducks and coot was nowhere to be seen it simply was not but a bleeding fragment of flesh with some purple and chestnut feathers clinging to it lay upon the bottom of the cage this morsel caught the eagle's eye he had been forgotten for the past two days the old one-legged keeper of the cages having vanished and he was ravenous with hunger he hopped down briskly to the floor grabbed the morsel and gulped it then he looked around hopefully for more there were no more such opportune tidbits within the cage but just outside he saw half of a big carp which had been blown in twain by a caprice of the explosion and tossed up here upon the grass this was just such a morsel as he was craving he thrust one great talon out between the bars and clutched at the prize but it was beyond his reach disappointed he tried the other claw balancing himself on one leg with widespread wings stretch and struggle as he would it was all in vain the fish lay too far off then he tried reaching through the bars with his head he elongated his neck till he almost thought he was a heron and still his great beak was snapping hungrily within an inch or two of the prize but not a hair's breadth closer could he get at last in a cold fury he gave it up and drew back and shook himself to rearrange the much dishevelled feathers of his neck just at this moment while he was still on the floor of the cage a high-velocity shell came by with its flat trajectory it passed just overhead swept the dome of the cage clean out of existence and whizzed onwards to explode with a curious grunting crash some hundreds of yards beyond the eagle looked up and gazed for some seconds before realizing that his prison was no longer a prison the path was clear above him to the free spaces of the air but he was in no unseemly haste his eye measured accurately the width of the exit and saw that it was awkwardly narrow for his great spread of wing he could not essay it directly from the ground his quarters being too straitened for free flight hopping upwards from limb to limb of the roosting tree he regained the topmost perch and found that though split by a stray splinter of the cage it was still able to bear his weight from this point he sprang straight upwards with one beat of his wings 
but the wing tips struck violently against each side of the opening and he was thrown back with such force that only by a furious flopping and struggle could he regain his footing on the perch after this unexpected rebuff he sat quiet for perhaps half a minute staring fixedly at the exit he was not going to fail again through misjudgment the straight top of the roosting tree extended for about three feet above his perch but this extension being of no use to him he had never paid any heed to it hitherto now however he marked it with new interest it was close below the hole in the roof he flopped up to it balanced himself for a second and once more sprang for the opening but this time with a short convulsive beat of wings only half spread the leap carried him almost through but not far enough for him to get another stroke of his wings clutching out wildly with stretched talons he succeeded in catching the end of a broken bar desperately he clung to it resisting the natural impulse to help himself by flapping his wings reaching out with his beak he gripped another bar and so steadied himself until he could gain a foothold with both talons then slowly like a dog getting over a wall he dragged himself forth and stood at last free on the outer side of the bars which had been so long his prison but the first thing he thought of was not freedom it was fish for perhaps a dozen seconds he gazed about him majestically and scanned with calm the toppling and crashing world then spreading his splendid wings to their fullest extent with no longer any fear of them striking against iron bars he dropped down to the grass beside the cage and clutched the body of the slain carp he was no more than just in time for a second later a pair of mink released from their captivity in perhaps the same way as he had been came gliding furtively around the base of the cage intent upon the same booty he turned his head over his shoulder and gave them one look then fell to tearing and gulping his meal as unconcernedly as if the two savage little beasts had been field mice the mink stopped short flashed white fangs at him in a soundless snarl of hate and whipped about to forage in some more auspicious direction when the eagle had finished his meal which took him indeed scarcely more time than takes to tell of it he wiped his great beak meticulously on the turf while he was doing so a shell burst so near him that he was half smothered in dry earth indignantly he shook himself hopped a pace or two aside ruffled up his feathers and proceeded to make his toilet as scrupulously as if no shells or sudden death were within a thousand miles of him the toilet completed to his satisfaction he took a little flapping run and rose into the air he flew straight for the highest point within his view which chanced to be the slender soaring spire of a church somewhere about the centre of the city as he mounted on a long slant he came into the level where most of the shells were travelling for their objective was not the little park with its zoo but a line of fortification some distance beyond above below around him streamed the terrible projectiles whinnying or whistling shrieking or roaring each according to its calibre and its type it seemed a miracle that he should come through that zone unscathed but his vision was so powerful and all-embracing his judgment of speed and distance so instantaneous and unerring that he was able to avoid without apparent effort all but the smallest and least visible shells and these latter by the favour of fate did not come his way he was more annoyed indeed by certain volleys of debris which occasionally spouted up at him with a disagreeable noise and by the evil-smelling smoke clouds which came volleying about him without any reason that he could discern he flapped up to a higher level to escape these annoyances and so found himself above the track of the shells then he made for the church spire and perched himself upon the tip of the great weather vane it was exactly what he wanted a lofty observation post from which to view the country round about before deciding in which direction he would journey from this high post he noticed that while he was well above one zone of shells there was still another zone of them screaming far overhead these projectiles of the upper strata of air were travelling in the opposite direction 
he marked that they came from a crowded line of smoke burst and blinding flashes just beyond the boundary of the city he decided that upon resuming his journey he would fly at the present level and so avoid traversing again either of the zones of death much to his disappointment he found that his present observation post did not give him as wide a view as he had hoped for the city of his captivity he now saw was set upon the loop of a silver stream in the centre of a saucer-like valley in every direction his view was limited by low encircling hills along one sector of this circuit that from which the shells of the lower stratum seemed to him to be issuing the hill rim and the slopes below it were fringed with vomiting smoke clouds and biting spurts of fire this did not however influence in the least his choice of the direction in which to journey instinct little by little as he sat there on the slowly veering vein was deciding that point for him his gaze was fixing itself more and more towards the north or rather the northwest for something seemed to whisper in his heart that there was where he would find the wild solitudes which he longed for the rugged and mist-wreathed peaks of scotland or north wales though he knew them not were calling to him in his new-found freedom the call however was not yet strong enough to be determining so having well fed and being beyond measure content with his liberty he lingered on his skyey perch and watched the crash of the opposing bombardments the quarter of the town immediately beneath him had so far suffered little from the shells and the church showed no signs of damage except for one gaping hole in the roof but along the line of the fortifications there seemed to be but one gigantic boiling of smoke and flames with continual spouting fountains of debris this inexplicable turmoil held his interest for a few moments then while he was wondering what it all meant an eleven-inch shell struck the church spire squarely about thirty feet below him the explosion almost stunned him the tip of the spire with the weathercock and the eagle still clinging to it went rocketing straight up into the air amid a stifling cloud of black smoke while the rest of the structure down to a dozen feet below the point of impact was blown to the four winds half stunned though he was the amazed bird kept his wits about him and clutched firmly to his flying perch till it reached the end of its flight and turned to fall then he spread his wings wide and let go the erratic mass of wood and metal dropped away and left him floating half blinded in the heart of the smoke cloud a couple of violent wing beats however carried him clear of the cloud and at once he shaped his course upwards as steeply as he could mount smitten with a sudden desire for the calm and the solitude which were associated in his memory with the uppermost deeps of air the fire from the city batteries had just now slackened for a little and the great bird's progress carried him through the higher shell zone without mishap in a moment or two he was far above those strange flocks which flew so straight and swift and made such incomprehensible noises in their flight presently too he was above the smoke the very last wisps of it having thinned off into the clear dry air he now began to find that he had come once more into his own peculiar realm the realm of the upper sky so high that as he thought no other living creature could approach him he arrested his ascent and began to circle slowly on still wings surveying the earth but now he received for the first time a shock hitherto the most astounding happenings had failed to startle him but now a pang of something very like fear shot through his stout heart a little to southward of the city he saw a vast pale yellow elongated form rising swiftly without any visible effort straight into the sky had he ever seen a sausage he would have thought that this yellow monster was shaped like one certain fine cords descended from it reaching all the way to the earth and below its middle hung a basket with a man in it it rose to a height some hundreds of feet beyond the level on which the eagle had been feeling himself supreme then it came to rest and hung there swaying slowly in the mild wind 
his apprehension speedily giving away to injured pride the eagle flew upwards in short steep spirals as fast as his wings could drive him not till he could once more look down upon the fat back of the glistening yellow monster did he regain his mood of unruffled calm but he regained it only to have it stripped from him a minute later with tenfold lack of ceremony far above him so high that even his undaunted wings could never venture thither he heard a fierce and terrible humming sound he saw something like a colossal bird or rather it was more suggestive of a dragonfly than a bird speeding towards him with never a single beat of its vast pale wings its speed was appalling the eagle was afraid but not with any foolish panic he knew that even as a sparrow would be to him so would he be to this unheard-of sovereign of the skies therefore it was possible the sovereign of the skies would ignore him and seek a more worthy opponent yes it was heading towards the giant sausage and the sausage plainly had no stomach for the encounter it seemed to shrink suddenly and with sickening lurches it began to descend as if strong hands were tugging upon the cords which anchored it to earth the eagle winged off modestly to one side but not far enough to miss anything of the stupendous encounter which he felt was coming here at last were events of a strangeness and a terror to move even his cool spirit out of its indifference now the giant insect was near enough for the eagle to mark that it had eyes on the undersides of its wings immense round coloured eyes of red and white and blue its shattering hum shook the eagle's nerves steady and seasoned though they were slanting slightly downwards it darted straight toward the sausage which was now wallowing fatly in its convulsive efforts to descend at the same time the eagle caught sight of another of the giant birds or insects somewhat different in shape and colour from the first darting up from the opposite direction was it too he wondered coming to attack the terrified sausage or to defend it before he could find an answer to this exciting question the first monster had arrived directly above the sausage and was circling over it at some height glaring down upon it with those great staring eyes of its wings something struck the sausage fairly in the back instantly with a tremendous windy roar the sausage vanished in a sheet of flame the monster far above it rocked and plunged in the uprush of tormented air the waves of which reached even to where the eagle hung poised and forced him to flap violently in order to keep his balance against them a few moments later the second monster arrived the eagle saw at once that the two were enemies the first dived headlong at the second spitting fire with a loud and dreadful rap rap rapping noise from its strange blunt muzzle the two circled around each other and over and under each other at a speed which made even the eagle dizzy with amazement and he saw that it was something more deadly than fire which spurted from their blunt snouts for every now and then small things which travelled too fast for him to see twanged past him with a vicious note which he knew for the voice of death he edged discreetly farther away evidently this battle of the giants was dangerous to spectators his curiosity was beginning to get sated he was on the point of leaving the danger area altogether when the dreadful duel came suddenly to an end he saw the second monster plunge drunkenly in wild ungoverned lurches and then drop head first down 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 straight as a stone till it crashed into the earth and instantly burst into flame he saw the great still eyes of the victor staring down inscrutably upon the wreck of its foe then he saw it whirl sharply tilting its rigid wings at so steep an angle that it almost seemed about to overturn and dart away again in the direction from which it had come he saw the reason for this swift departure a flock of six more monsters of the breed of the one just slain came sweeping up from the south to take vengeance for their comrade's defeat the eagle had no mind to await them he had had enough of wonders and the call in his heart had suddenly grown clear and intelligible 
mounting still upward till he felt the air growing thin beneath his wing beats he headed northwards as fast as he could fly he had no more interest now in the amazing panorama which unrolled beneath him in the thundering and screaming flights of shell which sped past in the lower strata of the air he was intent only upon gaining the wild solitudes of which he dreamed he marked others of the monsters which he so dreaded journeying sometimes alone sometimes in flocks but always with the same implacable directness of flight always with that angry and menacing hum which of all the sounds he had ever heard alone had power to shake his bold heart he noticed that sometimes the sky all about these monsters would be filled with sudden bursts of fleecy clouds looking soft as wool and once he saw one of these apparently harmless clouds burst full on the nose of one of the monsters which instantly flew apart and went hurtling down to earth in revolving fragments but he was no longer curious he gave them all as wide a berth as possible and sped on without delaying to note their triumphs or their defeats at last the earth grew green again below him the monsters the smoke the shells the flames the thunders were gradually left behind and far ahead at last he saw the sea flashing gold and sapphire beneath the summer sun soon for he flew swiftly it was almost beneath him his heart exulted at the sight then across that stretch of gleaming tide he saw a dim line of cliffs white cliffs such cliffs as he desired but at this point when he was so near his goal that fate which had always loved to juggle with him decided to show him a new one of her tricks two more monsters appeared diving steeply from the blue above him one was pursuing the other quite near him the pursuer overtook its quarry and the two spat fire at each other with that strident rap rap rapping sound which he so disliked he swerved as wide as possible from the path of their terrible combat and paid no heed to its outcome but as he fled something struck him near the tip of his left wing the shock went through him like a needle of ice or fire and he dropped leaving a little cloud of feathers in the air above to settle slowly after him he turned once completely over as he fell but presently with terrific effort he succeeded in regaining a partial balance he could no longer fully support himself still less continue his direct flight but he managed to keep on an even keel and to delay his fall he knew that to drop into the sea below him was certain death but he had marked that the sea was dotted with peculiar-looking ships long narrow dark ships which travelled furiously vomiting black smoke and carrying a white mass of foam in their teeth supporting himself with the last ounce of his strength till one of these rushing ships was just about to pass below him he let himself drop and landed sprawling on the deck half stunned though he was he recovered himself almost instantly clawed up to his feet steadied himself with one outstretched wing against the pitching of the deck and defied with hard undaunted eye and threatening beak a tall figure in blue white-capped and gold-braided which stood smiling down upon him by jove exclaimed sub-lieutenant james smith here's luck uncle sam's own chicken which he sent us as a mascot till his ships can get over and take a hand in the game with us delighted to see you old bird you've come to the right spot you have and we'll do the best we can to make you comfortable end of story two